things are going to change really fast today, like really fast. And it's and it's great. It's fantastic. I know a lot of people have work plans. You're going to get together with friends, maybe family tonight. You know, again, as Carolina plays at 2:45 this afternoon tonight, it's about having a Canes game and then flipping over when the Canes literally when the Canes are over and uh, aftermath is over. That NC State game will be starting up with Texas Tech late night, like late night. So. Tomorrow morning, expect a lot of bleary eyes and a lot of coffee runs at work. Just saying it's going to happen. Same thing with us on this show. Anything and everything could happen tomorrow morning right. if you yeah. tune in to the to – Tomorrow it could be crazy. See, I almost called it the drive. If you tune, if you tune in the next up with Paul Ihander and myself on the fan. It could get a little crazy for sure. Yeah, it's going to be a long – but a great sports day. Don't get me wrong. Today is one of those fantastic sports days. There was baseball this morning too, which was – uh, a matter of fact, I think that game is still going. Sorry about in, your Dodgers in Korea. Or did yeah, it's, it end? well, no, it's twelve. I, well, it no, was twelve no. to eleven. It's 12, top of the night. Twelve to eleven. Twelve to eleven. That is a lacrosse game. That is not baseball. Dodgers. Uh oh. No, don't. No, let's not do that. Play live play by play. When this thing okay, is over, right. let me know when the game is over. Uh, all right. You don't want to know what just happened. Ugh, okay. Well, all right. That's fine. Uh, John Calipari agrees with me. Kentucky basketball coach, third seed in this year's tournament out of the Midwest region. He agrees with me. Uh, he is playing, his team is playing Oakland in Pittsburgh, which is also where NC State is playing uh, against Texas Tech. Uh, he says he hopes the college basketball tournament stays where it is, does not want to be expanded. He says, I know people get mad. They get mad at the committee. I've been mad at the committee. You may be mad because of your seat or where they've shipped you to. It doesn't matter who the committee is. We're all going to be upset. He's he's like, basically, more teams are going to get in, but more teams could still get angry about being left out. And the Oakland coach who's going up against him says, it's the holy grail for mid-majors. The holy grail for mid-majors. So both of them agree with me. Now, if you listen to the SEC commissioner, Greg Sankey, who just throws out comments left and right these days without really thinking, like he has like... The Austin, remember the movie Austin Powers? Yes. When he comes out of the cryo freeze <laughs> and he starts talking about all the women in the room. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry. And they go, sorry, Austin, your, your cryo freeze doesn't allow you to have inner monologue. That's one heck of a comparison that you is just made Greg to Greg Sankey. Sankey. He has no inner monologue. Greg Sankey is Austin Powers. He just wow. goes out and just spits stuff out, like literally talking about, hey, we should expand the tournament to like 90 teams. I'm like, are you serious? No. <sighs> well, unfortunately, Kevin Keats was asked the same question, and here's what he said. Um, I just think it's too many, you know, student athletes that not get the opportunity to play in postseason. You know, when you look at football, they don't have that issue. You know, you can make a bowl game and, you know, under 500 now, and the experience of, you know, we talk about the student athlete experience, and, the only thing that really, in my opinion, that has not changed is expanding the the um, the tournament. And I don't have a number. I don't know what that should be. But I do think we should give more schools opportunities to be able to get in the tournament. Kevin, <laughs> no, what are we doing? At this point, this point, the last time – uh, the NCAA expanded the tournament when they included the the first four, which has now been more than a decade, which is amazing. Uh, there were 280 or so D1 schools. There are now three, near 340 of them, of which 68, roughly 16% of the team, so one in six, gets to play in the NCAA basketball tournament. And then you have the NIT, which the NCAA also took over to correct the whole idea of the transfer portal. Affecting that, just move the transfer portal. So you still have 100 teams playing in the postseason. Now, the glory of quote-unquote the NCAA tournament is much different. Agreed. I'm like, let's be honest. Wolfpack fans and Carolina fans knew it last year. You were invited to the NIT last year, Carolina. What would you say? No, we're good. If the Wolfpack were invited, say, for argument's sake here, if they had lost in the tournament final to Carolina and were given an NIT opportunity, it doesn't have the sexiness, right? Yeah. It just doesn't have the sexiness. But to expand the tournament creates, yes, student-athlete experience set aside also means you're either pushing the basketball schedule backwards into the precious college football calendar or you're extending the season because you just don't – there's the calendar and time keeps ticking, right? The calendar it has only so many days in it. 
time in a day only has so many days in it. So you either have to push the start of college basketball back even further, or you just have to make the college basketball season reach even deeper into April. You are talking about adding another week, which moves all your tournaments backwards or moves them all forwards. Not everybody gets to have a participation trophy or a ribbon. 68, is it too small? It, for argument's sake, we all understand that things have to evolve and move forward. And there is that idea of the student-athlete experience. And there is that idea, and I will concede that, that the NIT, in terms of the shine, is completely different from the NCAAs. Is it fair to say you're also running to the chance of maybe shortening the college basketball season, too, by taking away some of these non-conference games where it's like a uh, – you know, no offense to any of the team down the list, but like an NC State versus Detroit, like well, we saw earlier in the season. And so there's the trickle effect of the economics of what college sports has be become, it be it become, is becoming, has become, wherever you stand on that. You have to take away money or you have to take away time. Which is more valuable to you? For the schools, like you just mentioned, a Detroit Mercy who has to come to NC State and play a basketball game but gets paid to do so, are there fewer opportunities to do that? So you're already cutting down on the opportunities, these quote-unquote student-athlete opportunities that Coach Keats is talking about, for them to go experience other things. Like, they're getting that experience. Queens plays at Duke for a reason. Yeah. You know, <laughs> prior to that game, they were out taking photos on at Cameron Indoor. There is a magic that comes with that. There is some specialness that comes with it. If those, something has to give in terms of those opportunities. And you're right, that's a good point, uh, Graham. If you have to shorten your season to include more conference games so you can figure out how to work your tournament in there, those smaller schools still don't benefit from that, which is the point that the Oakland head coach was making, Greg Campy, who is now in his 40th season coaching at Oakland, which is just amazing, by the way, that the tournament is the holy grail for teams like his, teams that have to travel to go play the Kansases of the world, the USC's, the Texas A&M's, or whatever, to go get paid. Those opportunities get smaller and smaller. Can you add four more teams? Yeah, I suppose you could add four more teams, but you still have to deal with the calendar issue. Do you push forward or do you push back? And Coach K says, yeah, we probably need to take a look at it, but there are fewer things that are left in college athletics that are as neat and as tidy as college basketball, this March Madness tournament. Why keep screwing it up? I don't think it needs screwing up. So... Coach Keats, respectfully, you and I disagree on this one. I'm Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 999 The Fan. The NCAA tournament tips off today at noon with our feature game between Michigan State and Mississippi State right here on 999 The Fan. UNC, who earned a number one seed, will play the Wagner Seahawks around 245 today in the first round of the NCAA tournament. In the West Region and Charlotte, you can also hear that game right here on the fan as well. 11 seed NC State will face 6 seed at Texas Tech in Pittsburgh tonight around 940 in the first round of the NCAA tournament in the South Region from Pittsburgh. You can hear that game in our sister station, Mix 101.5. It's hockey night in Carolina as the Hurricanes welcome the Philadelphia Flyers to PNC Arena. Pre-game coverage begins on the fan at 6.30 with Stormwatch, hosted by Adam Gold, putt drop at 7 after the game. Check out the Canes Corner podcast, hosted by Adam Gold, live on the fan's YouTube channel. Find these stories and more on WRLSportsFan.com. The NFL has a competition committee, and they're going to have apparently some serious rule changes that are coming down the pike. Some of it's kind of like, meh. I'm like, there's something, there's a hip, hip drop tackle that they're looking to ban, but the Players Association's like, listen, if you're going to change the way we have to tackle along with protecting the quarterback and doing all these things, we may not have much of an NFL left. It may be full flag football, and to be honest, I don't want to see that. They're talking about no more fair catches. Uh, on kickoffs, touchbacks would move out to the 35-yard line now. So you're you're gonna you're gonna kick into the end zone as a touchback, and you're just gonna go to the 35. So why don't they just put the ball at the 35 and start there? There's gonna be like a designated landing zone now <laughs> for two returners between the goal line and the 20. And if you're in the and if you're in the 20-yard line, if the ball gets inside the landing zone, 
only the kickers and returners would be allowed to move before the ball touches the ground. But uh, what? Yeah, so everyone it's freeze. Everyone freezes until they catch the ball and then you get to run. You also can you also have to alert officials before onside kicks and then players could go into the onside formation. Oh no. So it's like it's no. like the, it's like the tackle reporting, right? Tackle the rece- every once in a while you see the fat guy score with the tackle has to report and then catches, you know, a ball that happens like once or twice a season. The other one that I teased up that could uh, really extend a game, the Indianapolis Colts, who have been smoking something funny apparently, suggested that coaches would be able to challenge every penalty. Every penalty. Huh. Just throwing it out there. Every penalty. I Please say no to that. Please just say no. All right, the Olympics are going to have a red zone. NFL red zone, right? So NFL red zone is, we're all very familiar with it. NFL fans, you pay the premium for it. It's whip around coverage. So you go around the you go around the horn left and right and left and right with all the scoring, all the scoring opportunities. It's Scott Hansen who hosts this thing where they're going to run it back with the Olympics. The Olympics is going to do red zone, but they're calling it gold zone. And they're going to do it every day of the Olympic Games. I can't wait to watch the 200 meter, 300 meter, 400 meter all at once, whatever meter you want to throw in there. It's Scott Hansen of NFL Red Zone who's going to host. Andrew Siciliano, who used to host NFL Red Zone. Siciliano, by the way, a guy I hold a fantasy football championship over one time. One time. And then they're going to have uh, Matt Eisman and Akbar Biajamila, who you might remember from American Ninja Warrior on NBC. They're going to be part of that coverage during the Olympics. So they're going to do this big whip around, uh, whip around thing uh, for, I mean, because, and they've done it in the past. This is not like a new thing for them. But the fact that they're adding more hosts and that they're going to be adding more events just based on the time zone. So it's going to start at like 5 in the morning, our time here in the Triangle, and it's going to run until like 7 o'clock at night. Just swimming, diving, fencing, equestrian, whatever it happens to be. All right, came out uh, late last night. Uh, North Carolina Courage are going to play in a 33-match a tournament that starts this summer. It's called the NWSL times Liga MX Femenil Summer Cup. So it's a women's soccer tournament with five groups. NC Courage are part of Group E. It was announced yesterday. It'll be Orlando and Racing Louisville alongside uh, Liga MX Reyadas de Monterrey. So the mo- team from Monterrey, Mexico. And they will play each opponent once in group play. This is going to last all summer long and run all the way into the mid-fall, all the way to late October. They will have two games uh, on Saturday the 20th, uh, July 20th. They will play at home against Orlando. And then Wednesday the 31st, which I think will be kind of cooler because we've seen Orlando play, on Wednesday, July 31st at Wake Med, it'll be the Monterey squad playing NC Courage, which is going to be, which I think will be very cool. So uh, NC Courage playing in this in this international tournament, uh, it's the first ever that they're having it, and then there'll be a bunch. They haven't announced uh, ticket information or whatnot, but this sounds amazing. Uh, they've they did a leagues cup between MLS and Liga MX that they continue doing on the men's side. So this is the uh, women's equivalent to it. So this is this is awesome. Uh, two top women's soccer leagues getting together, international uh, competition. Not just friendlies, but actual competition, which is awesome. And again, mark that date on your calendar. Wednesday, July 31st. I think that's going to be the one you're going to want to be at because I think it'll be crazy. I think it'll be absolutely amazing to have a game like that. All right, last thing for us all here, Graham. Uh, We've seen this at other ballparks, so this is not like this kind of new thing, but I think it's interesting because at some point when you do this as a franchise you were like, man, we got to put some butts in the seats kind of thing. The Miami Marlins have announced all-you-can-eat seats for four full sections. Four sections of seats, 52 bucks. You can have all-you-can-eat hot dogs, nachos with cheese, because you know, otherwise it's just chips. Right? Sounds beautiful. Right. Cheeseburgers, chili dogs, chili nachos, popcorn, peanuts, cookies, uh, non-alcoholic beverages, and water. 52 bucks. 
Oh, man. 52 bucks. It only runs through the seventh inning. That's almost as much as parking at PNC Arena, so that's one heck of a deal. So 52 bucks to sit up in these seats. Four, they're doing four sections. Like the Marlins are doing four sections. Here's the deal. They're going to have to recruit for, like, park cleanup workers <laughs> because the amount of food that's going to get, first of all, ingested there and the fact that they're offering, and I know this is going to be gross and it's low-hanging fruit, but I'm going there, the fact that they're offering chili dogs and chili nachos means that they could probably sell, like, front-of-the-line passes for the bathrooms at, like, the 6th, 7th, and 8th innings. Like, listen, we know what we fed you. We know what you're eating. And we know you got to walk out into the humidity of South Florida here in about an hour once the game is over. So, for an extra $10, you can move to the front of the line for the restrooms on the concourse. It's what it is. That's, wow. <laughs> Just... Suddenly, I no longer want breakfast after I skipped it this morning. Yeah, yeah. I, there's there's no reason to have uh, more breakfast whatsoever. Uh, last night, by the way, in the NIT, the Villanova team, uh, Villanova men's team, played basketball, lost to VCU 70-61, to along with that all-you-can-eat theme. They tried to fill the place with a $2 beer night. They tried to do $2 beer night, $2 hot dog night. They drew 1,700 people. That was it. The place was practically empty. No one was there. And VCU got the win. So congratulations to the Rams as the Wildcats fell short. If you're a Villanova fan, sorry. I guess you're due for an overhaul or rehab because apparently you don't like $2 beer.